Hello there, and welcome to all. We have uh, folks still joining us and uh, really happy to have you with us, both in our uh, United States market and our European markets. Very excited uh, about this uh, joint webinar and the, the opportunity to have this conversation. Uh, this is the latest of DSEF Insights webinars, uh, which is part of DSA's ongoing Engage series. I'm Gary Huggins, Executive Director of the Direct Selling Education Foundation in the US. And today's discussion will be about Stay or Leave, its new insights on Salesforce turnover in Europe and the US. Um, as you all know, for direct selling companies, whether you're in Europe, US, distributors at the heart of your company's business, their intentions to leave and their reasons for staying uh, are important drivers of your company's business and your Salesforce performance. Uh, we have two academics who are leaders and influencers in their field to share their expertise and insights from their research. Uh, that research has been made possible through a partnership uh, between USDSA, uh, our friends at Celdia, and the Direct Selling Education Foundation. Um, from DSCF's perspective, we really want to say a special thank you and recognition to our friends, uh, Lori Alexander and her colleagues at Celdia for allowing the use of European Salesforce survey data, a lot of European Salesforce survey data, uh, to uh, drive this research. Uh, it is also driven by um, DSCF's nearly five years investment in building partnerships uh, with the academic community through our fellows program, in the, principally in the US, but uh, by extension, uh, touching Europe, India, Canada, South Africa, and Thailand. Some really important connections happening there uh, in the academic community where we come together uh, with the direct selling community to um, help us all uh, improve what we're doing. Uh, we also have a guest to give us an important industry perspective. Uh, very pleased to have that leading industry voice uh, join us and share his perspectives on this important research, as well as the work we're doing in this partnership generally. Uh, so I want to be brief uh, and introducing our guests for today's discussion. We'll put their full bios uh, in the chat section so that you can sort of look deeper into who they are and, and why they're here. Uh, first, I'll introduce, I'll introduce uh, Robert Cabot, who's the CEO of GenCon. Uh, that's an industry leading enterprise software solutions company that works with direct selling companies around the world. Uh, Robert is a DSEF board member uh, and played an important role in supporting our fellows program, the building our fellows program and what's led to a lot of the research and insights that you see coming out of the foundations and our partners. He's also the driving force behind launching the excellent new DSA publication, the Direct Selling Journal. Uh, it's produced by Melissa Brunton and her team at USDSA. I encourage you all to look into that. Uh, and an important partner in expanding this partnership between DSEF and our friends at Celdia. So really happy to have you, Robert, uh, for this discussion, for your insights. We also have uh, two distinguished and prolific DSEF fellows who are the lead investigators on the research that we're going to dis dis discuss today. Um, they are Manfred Croft, who is Professor of Marketing and Director of Institute of Marketing at the University of Münster in Germany. He's also well known for his contributions to the fields of sales management, channel management, customer relationship management, among others. Uh, won many awards for his papers, his research, um, published in, in a number of books, and uh, a highly valued DSEF fellow. Manfred's been a great partner for a long time, and we appreciate that. Um, Dr. Ann Coghlan, an emerita professor of marketing at Northwestern University in the US. Her current research projects include management of multi-level marketing distribution channels, Salesforce diversification, optimal group incentive payments, and direct selling monitoring and compliance, and was also one of the co-authors of the paper, Direct Selling Under Scrutiny, which is a really important paper in the US. We'll put the uh, link to that paper in the chat, but that paper was sort of an answer to uh, a publication that many of you may know about called Alchemy of the Pyramid Scheme. It's sort of a rebuttal and answer and a, a more accurate um, a contextualization of the industry than that paper put forward, the value of these academic partnerships that we have. Um, Anne is also a DSCF fellow and a member of our academic advisory council. Uh, finally, before I hand it off, I want to recognize the contributions of two other people. Uh, Dr. Leo Poss, a professor of marketing at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, 
uh, who had a, a important part of this work, and Michael Gerke, PhD student and research assistant at the University of Munster. Uh, we thank them for their work on this research project. Um, with that, um, I just will say finally that if you like what you hear here, uh, there is an article by Anne and Monford that's in the uh, forthcoming Direct Selling Journal. Uh, I, I encourage you to pick that up. We want to have an interactive discussion, so please use that Q&A function uh, as the presentation is going to uh, share your questions with us. And with that, let me turn it over to Monford to, uh, to begin. Monford? Thank you very much, uh, dear Gary and also DSEF and Saldia, uh, both uh, Anne Carglin and I myself, we are very grateful together with our co-authors about the opportunity that you provide with excellent data and all the support and collaboration over the years. So um, Anne and myself we will kind of like share uh, the, uh, not burden, but uh, the uh, kind of uh, happiness to kind of uh, provide you with some insights in let's say like the next 20, 25 minutes, um, which will be tough because we have a lot to share actually, but, uh, and please also get in touch with us or via uh, DSA, DSEF and Celdia with us uh, for uh, further information. Um, so actually Anne will start with um, talking a bit about the US data, Anne. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're, we're actually going to talk about two different research projects that we're concurrently working on. Um, I will be talking in the second part of the presentation about our work with US data provided to us by the DSA. And here the focus is more on how segment membership, particularly concerning why people choose to stay as a distributor, uh, how does that affect the productivity dr drivers for direct selling distributors? We're gonna focus on income and downline as key productivity drivers there. And you can see a few details here about our data set size. Uh, we're gonna have a few key insights concerning the fact that whether you stay for a career uh, has very significant effects on these productivity drivers, as well as whether you said one of the reasons you stay is because you like buying products at a discount. The other thing that, that we'll wanna drive home to you uh, across both studies is that the insights here we hope are easily usable by you if you wish to put together uh, survey questions for your own distributor force and sort of, uh, you know, check the uh, similarity of your results compared to ours. So that's about all I'll say for now, but uh, I'll turn it back to Manfred to talk about the, um, the sort of sadder, why do people leave or what's the propensity to leave research? Yes, thank you, Anne. And for that, we actually uh, kind of cross the Atlantic and uh, look at Europe. Uh, so we have these two continents um, covered actually in our two large scale survey data that we could use to analyze and come up with, I would say, very interesting insights. And as Anne already emphasized, this is about turnover drivers. And um, one question that we looked into was um, does country matter in a, in a sense, which is always believed and also widely covered in textbooks. And uh, we use this in our kind of teaching. It's like a managerial uh, insight, but um, I will briefly show you that actually country doesn't matter as a driver of uh, intent to leave in our um, data. Um, but what we find, and that's kind of, I guess, insightful and interesting for you as uh, managers or being involved in direct selling, that um, there are major drivers um, and we only need a few um, variables, uh, like uh, two handful of, of factors um, that are very strong in explaining uh, the very high likelihood of people to possibly leave or discontinue as a distributor. Um, among them, um, as a major driver, um, the willingness to recommend or to refer, called here referral, and also Anne will come back to that in her study uh, about the uh, US data set, uh, satisfaction with the um, activity and also tenure, meaning the duration, the, the time spent uh, in the um, direct selling firm or indirect selling, they are the strongest in explaining why people leave or stay. 
Um, what we also find is income effects that are interesting and we have our strong beliefs and I will actually save that for a bit later, but um, total income actually doesn't play a role, which was uh, astounding, I would say, uh, to us. Um, and again, as Anne already said, um, an implication in both studies actually is with very simple survey tools and well-established variables or items, you can actually, um, and only a few of them, um, come up with very insightful um, findings uh, that are managerially relevant. Uh, let me briefly look actually at um, kind of like Europe, um, but very briefly. Um, what we find is, or if you look at our continent here, it is very diverse. You have uh, variants uh, across countries. You have countries with people having a relatively high income, as you can see by the uh, numbers uh, reported on the upper right side, the GDP per capita. It varies between something like $30,000 and uh, $60,000. So there's a big difference actually between lowest and highest income. And what you see here is not a complete list, but the 11 countries that are also represented in our CELDIA data set with about 27,000 individual responses by um, salespeople or distributors. Um, and the employment rate again, or unemployment rate um, as the complement to 100%, uh, again, is very different between um, countries that you would maybe call the most developed uh, such, for example, um, the Netherlands on the right-hand side, if you look at employment rate, with Spain uh, with a much, much lower uh, employment rate. And we also see this reflected in the uh, um, shares of distributors in our data that we investigated um, that have an inclination to actually leave um, the firm or end the uh, uh, distributorship. And it's a bit oversimplifying, but in those countries with like um, higher unemployment, lower uh, GDP per capita, you observe also low uh, kind of intentions to leave. And the opposite is true for countries uh, such as here to the upper, to the right hand side, UK and the Netherlands again with relatively uh, high inclinations to, to leave. But uh, to make a long story short, actually, we believe that we would find uh, strong differences um, in the effects that actually drive uh, the turnover and tension uh, across countries, but we didn't find it. Um, so this is kind of amazing. I don't want to kind of spend too much time with non-findings, but at least we expected that country would matter and it does not. But uh, the other side of the coin, so to say, is or the interesting insight, it also means that whatever I report in the following means it applies to Sweden, Spain, Italy, the UK, right? You name it. So we find these effects and they are independent of which country you belong to. And that is in a sense, interesting. We still have different levels of intent to leave between countries, but the effects that actually lead to a higher or lower um, intention to leave for a separate and individual distributor are very similar, you could even say the same um, across countries, uh, which was, as I said, a very interesting and rather unexpected finding. So let us look a bit deeper into what kind of effects we actually observe. And um, we had a large number of uh, factors and variables that we could look into, but it really could be reduced to a small set of relevant uh, items or manifestations or questions uh, that really explain different intentions to leave. And these bars that you see here, and you also see here four categories of drivers such as attitudes and commitment or income, um, they actually represent the relative power or importance in explaining uh, differences. So whether people have this high or low um, propensity to leave or to continue as a distributor. And you see this big bar, um, I guess Trump would have said it's huge, um, attitudes and commitment. Uh, this is really driving or strongly explaining uh, differences between people having a very high and a very low 
um, likelihood of leaving. And to kind of tell you what is behind attitudes and commitment, because this is a very fuzzy term, I would say, um, on the one side, it's uh, this willingness to refer. Do distributors have this willingness, the inclination to talk about uh, their activity and job uh, of direct selling and the firm they represent, being proud of it and tell friends, neighbors, etc. This is really an exciting uh, kind of activity. So they are willing to actually refer it as a job. Um, and this is, again, among the, uh, or within attitudes and commitment as the most important category of explaining um, intention to, to, to leave. Uh, by far the strongest. It's like three times as strong as the other two, which are satisfaction and tenure. I could go very deep here, but let me just uh, select one other interesting um, category, which is income. And we usually spend quite some time thinking about compensation plans and designs. And um, income is uh, again, a significant driver, all actually that are listed here are significant in a statistical sense, much weaker than the others, but uh, still strong. And here we again have interesting observations. Um, the first one is total income. So the amount of money that you earn in a year does not make a difference. So independent of whether you have low a medium or high income, the inclination to kind of discontinue your distributorship is the same. Again, unexpected. But what is also very interesting is um, income changes, they matter. So it's not the total income, but income changes relative to, for example, last year's income. And if you had uh, a much or yeah, substantially higher income compared to last year, well, you're um, likelihood of kind of discontinuing as a distributor would be lower. That's why I have a minus here. If you had an increase in income, it would be higher. But the effect actually is different. And to kind of visualize that, um, and this is perfectly in line with um, the prospect theory, which has been introduced uh, in our like uh, um, science by Kahneman and Tversky, to a Nobel laureates, actually, they won the award for that. Um, they came up with this idea of people that actually are exposed to losing money, they would actually take stronger risks and they would also be very averse to losing. And for gains, actually, people have still a preference. It's positive, they like it, uh, but it does not affect them as much as a potential loss. And what we find here is perfectly in line with prospect theory. Um, so we have this kind of um, effect that losses have a higher impact uh, than uh, gains. Um, to leave some time for, for Anne to share also insights about the US uh, data and uh, what actually explains staying more than leaving, what is actually here my focus. Uh, let me briefly summarize, we found this um, non-effect for country, country doesn't matter. Uh, so we have actually um, less differences than we expected. We observe there are strong effects of um, attitudes and commitment, in particular willingness to refer. And uh, for a manager, for example, you do not even have to maybe conduct a survey and ask questions. You could also closely observe what your distributors do. If they have growing um, downlines, if you observe that their customer base is very active, it's a clear kind of um, sign um, or indication of them having this kind of uh, willingness to recommend because it means recommending the business and also kind of building their customer base. Total income I just covered uh, does not have an effect but changes and losses more than gains. In a sense, if you look at your kind of um, usual celebration of superstars um, at annual meetings, well, that is uh, important and shows effects. But if you're interested in reducing like the inclination of people to leave, you should also look at the volatility of income, especially losses. So that is maybe a different 
uh, view. And at least for us, this was an eye opener. Um, thus, I would actually like to hand over to Anne. Thank you. Thanks, Manfred. So, so now we have some insights into uh, drivers of people expressing an, an intention to leave. Um, <clears throat> I want to turn the table a little bit with the US data and think about the importance of reasons people state that they want to stay. Uh, and so this, this survey is fantastic because it allows the distributor to state uh, what are the reasons that they give for staying as a direct selling distributor? And there are several of them. Uh, we find that two of them, the, uh, the um, notion of staying for a career and the notion of staying because I like buying products at a discount are quite interesting, not only on their own face, uh, but because they temper the productivity of other drivers of really important productivity outcomes we care about, uh, in particular income and downline size. Uh, so in order to sort of bring that kind of complex idea to light, uh, I want to show you how uh, one of our predictor variables, which is tenure, the amount of time a person has been a distributor, uh, it impacts income and downline size and how that effect is tempered uh, by these, these uh, reasons that people choose to stay. And in particular, um, to identify those really as important segmentation variables. The group of people who say that they stay because DS is a career for me is a segment. Uh, and it's a different segment than those who don't. And the same is true for those who state as one of their reasons to stay, I stay for products at a discount versus not. So let's turn to the next slide and, and take a look. Uh, at how that comes to life when we think about tenure, amount of time you've been a distributor as a driver of uh, income uh, and downline. So if you go to the next slide, thanks, Manfred. All right, so here, what we have is a set of results we have from the data that helps us see how tenure in years, that's the horizontal axis in this graph. So we have uh, various times three quarters of a year, a year and a half, two and a half years, four years, eight years, and 12 years uh, of having been a distributor with this firm. And the question is, well, so does tenure impact income? And indeed it does, it, it always does. It's, there's a very durable driver uh, or correlate of income. People who are longer lived distributors tend to be higher income distributors. However, what we have here is really two lines and these two lines, uh, one there's one for each segment of stayer. I stay for a career in DS, that's our red line. And uh, I don't stay for a career in DS, that's our blue line. Now notice, you could stay for lots of other reasons, but we're just highlighting the impact of being what we'll call a careerist versus not staying for a career. Now, I'm sure you could have intuited this beforehand. People who do not express a, a career interest in direct selling don't tend to have as high income. Uh, and that indeed uh, is generally true here, except for the very youngest in terms of tenure distributors. Um, but as we get to more experienced distributors, we not only see that tenure rises, but it rises much faster. It tends to be higher at a greater rate for those with greater tenure. In fact, if you look at, for example, the eight year um, cohort, people have been distributors for eight years, uh, that difference is about a 62% difference from not being a careerist to being a careerist. So you go from uh, about 9,000, I'm sorry, about uh, 12,000, $13,000 in income to almost $30,000 in income in our data set which is a very significant difference. So figuring out who says, I treat this as a career is actually quite a useful piece of information if you want to um, identify who's a, a potential longer term really high producer. Okay, now let's take a look at a different reason to stay, which is I stay for products at a discount. And so here the notion is I can either say yes or no to that reason to stay. Again, I might stay for other reasons, but whether, one of the reasons I stay is for products at a discount. Again, the red line is, uh, is the 
graph of predicted income for people uh, by tenure, for people who say, I stay for product at a discount. And you see it does rise, but moderately as tenure increases. But for those who don't say, I stay for product discount, it rises a lot faster, right? So we see this interesting flip. Uh, discount buyers' income rises with tenure less than those who don't say, I buy for products at discount. So if we put that together, and you see the two curves together, the two graphs together, uh, you see that how you segment, how the, the person segments themselves and identifies themselves into a segment has a pretty profound impact in the differentials in income with respect to one of, what, uh, to one of our important drivers. And these differences increase as tenure increases. Okay, so let's go on then and look at our other productivity factor, which is downline. And you'll see the the, uh, on the next slide, you'll see the same drift here. Um, sorry, if you could go back to the, there you go. Thanks, Margaret. Um, you're going to see the same general vision in the graph um, that downline size also rises with tenure faster or more uh, when the person says, I stay for a career, than when it's the person says, I don't care about a career. Again, there's still a positive effect of tenure but it's much more moderated, significantly so, uh, for those who don't treat the DS um, opportunity as a career. And here that difference at eight years is uh, uh, 29 people in a downline is predicted in our data set uh, for the eight year tenured person who says, this is not a career for me on average, and 51 people in a downline for those who do. Uh, and that difference is again, not only significant, but it is, uh, it is noticeably large. It's a 76% uh, increase from the lower to the higher level. Again, we can look at the other uh, segmentation uh, um, mechanism, which is I stay for products at a discount. And you see the same flavor as before. Those who stay for products at a discount, yes, their, their uh, downline size rises with tenure, but moderately. Those who say, no, I don't really care about products at discount. That's not one of my big reasons to stay. They tend to build a larger downline over time. And again, that, that effect is a difference. It is uh, not only noticeably different, it is significantly different with uh, about a 40% decline um, in downline size from the, the uh, people who don't treat this as a driver of staying to those who do. So again, segmentation is kind of big. If we put it together, we see the same sort of flip across the two factors with increasing differences for both of them as tenure increases. So one of the interesting questions is, does tenure matter for productivity? The answer is yes, but that sort of masks the way in which it matters, which is a function of segmentation. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And, and so that's just one insight. We have lots more, but again, we wanted to give you a flavor so that your interest is piqued. But I wanna summarize uh, this research by saying, first of all, the key takeaway is segmentation matters and it tempers these drivers. So the same driver doesn't work the same for everybody. And we now have ways of identifying ways in which these things differ. So careerists are different from non-careerists. So if you have a positive driver, of important outcomes, uh, then it's going to be more productive for people who say, I stay for a career. Discount, people say, I stay, among other things, for products at a discount are different from those who don't. For them, it's lower productivity with respect to positive drivers like tenure. And, and just so you know, we've done lots of other drivers in this model. And to give you a flavor, uh, a couple of the really important ones that, uh, that pop up are referral, as Montford referred to, uh, and also hours working the direct selling distributorship. These are very powerful with uh, uh, powerful um, uh, drivers of income and downline, and they are similar, similarly significantly tempered by these segmentation drivers. So what do, what do I see? What do we see as these implications for action? First of all, you might like to understand better uh, the size of your groups. Uh, by segments that, that correspond to what we see in these data. We can't guarantee that in your data, the exact same graphs will occur, of course. It depends on the nature of your whole distributor force 
uh, and so on. But we expect that the general drift of these effects may well be the same. And once you identify these important segments, you can think about how to act on those, uh, those insights by considering communications to your distributor forces uh, and or training tools, perhaps to encourage higher potential segments that can uh, develop and improve productivity even better. So I'll stop with that. Um, I think that may be the last slide. Is that right, Manfred? Yes. Okay, great. Um, nice. And in Manfred, thank you. That was a terrific presentation and, and a good conversation starter as well. And if I could just go through uh, a, a couple questions that I have, and we have a couple from our, um, from our audience participants as well. Um, first to Manfred, um, whether focused on the European data or perhaps both, because I know you guys work together on both. You mentioned how support provided by the company or F upline affects uh, turnover intentions among European distributors, at least. Uh, what else can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, again, we had a very interesting finding there, uh, support by sponsors or your direct kind of uh, superior, if you, if you want to say that with those words and support provided by the organization. And we had this anticipation that the person that is kind of like closest to you, your immediate like sponsor, that support provided by that person would be a very substantial uh, driver or affect your turnover intention. And actually it doesn't, it's non-significant. While, and this is the interesting message maybe to, to firm representatives here, um, the support provided by the organization actually had this strong effect, substantial, significant, and statistical sense, uh, reducing or lowering the intention to quit, uh, which we found, again, unexpected, interesting, and I guess maybe also interesting for, for managers, right? Um, sure, got you. Well, thank you. And looking at... Um, direct selling supplemental income for uh, a number of salespeople, most salespeople perhaps, uh, and they have other gigs, they have other independent work, they have other jobs. How does having a primary job or another gig, other gig work affect uh, direct selling income? In your uh, well, how, how it actually affects the turnover intention, that's what we looked at here. Um, and it actually, uh, it increased the intention to leave if you kind of had a part-time job, so to say, another one outside of direct selling. Uh, so that seems to be like, let's call it like. Yep. I think Manfred may have, have frozen. I thought that was a pregnant pause there. Um, forgive me. So Anne, maybe if I could ask you a question uh, while Manfred yeah. um, comes back to us, did I hear him? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm back. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so we just, yeah, we've got some, Go somehow ahead. we got discontinued here. Uh, some, some, somebody between us, right? <laughs> On the way. Um, yeah. What I wanted to say is, uh, so this uh, part, other part-time jobs outside of direct selling, they are truly like competitors. They are kind of um, the alternative, so to say, for people who are distributors. While if you have a full-time job, actually, we didn't find this effect, right? So mm -hmm. a full-time job outside direct selling is not uh, actually affecting your attitude towards direct selling or your intention to leave. Uh, again, not obvious. Um, and we are actually, as academics, we always like these unexpected findings, uh, but very strong. Uh, so we double-checked, uh, believe us. <laughs> Okay. Uh, anything else to say on the key intentions or key drivers of intentions to lead uh, and what impact they have in European markets? Um, well, we, we also looked at, um, at other factors, uh, for example, like um, general motives, impediments, uh, barriers. Um, there are some that actually um, play a role um, for example, some people uh, who really believe that direct selling is only an activity for like the most ambitious entrepreneurs, if that's the general attitude, they have this high inclination also to terminate their distributorship. Again, it tells us that knowing a bit more about the attitude 
about uh, motivations of uh, distributors is really helpful. And we believe that this is also an area where uh, like you as a decision maker in direct selling can still kind of uh, improve your decision making uh, yeah. by just knowing more, learning more about the uh, attitudes of, of those people who more or less build, uh, build these firms, right? Okay, thank you, Manfred. And, and shifting a little bit to the US market and Anne, we have a question from our audience and, and I hope that I'm pronouncing this correctly, but Claire Waters from Advocare. Uh, is asking, what are you seeing in terms of trends and turnover within the U.S. and what's working in terms of efforts to mitigate turnover? What are people responding positively to? So we're talking about turnover or, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so I, I can speak very generally to this. Um, understand that in the data we have here, and this is true both for the Saldia European data and the U.S. data, um, we don't have true company information uh, over time that helps us put together a, a more time-based um, set of insights. Um, one of the things I want to say about turnover is that actual turnover, I think, as we know, is much higher than, you know, two to nine percent. So that the numbers that you see in the Celdia data are for a question that says, do you intend, do you have an intention to turn over in the coming year? Uh, and we know actual turnover may be much higher than that. Uh, so, so, you know, I think uh, the general things that I've seen are, are very consistent with what our findings are that Manfred presented, particularly um, disturbances in uh, one's productivity in their distributorship is very predictive of turnover. Um, and so consistency is quite important. And I think when you see big drops in a particular firm's set of distributors, there's usually something um, about their ability to keep working the business the way they've become accustomed to. And it just isn't as, as good as it was before. And they therefore leave. And that can be anything from a set of uh, changes of policies that the firm puts into place, possibly for particularly sensible reasons, or um, the entry of competition or economic factors uh, widely, um, you know, widely expressed. The other thing I'll say is, and, and this I have seen across, uh, very durably across firms, is that um, actual turnover is very, very high for very young distributors. And actual turnover is pretty low once people get to be longer tenured distributors. So, um, and again, I think anyone who's looked in their data will find that that's true. But what I'll say is I have actually looked at that across many industries in the US labor market uh, with US Department of Labor data. It's absolutely not a surprise. Uh, this is not something that tars DS, for example, with a negative light. It is not a signal, for example, that people have been misled because Turnover has exactly the same characteristic in lots of industries, uh, including you know, hospitality, even including in places like law firms uh, and other professional firms, realty, and so on. So, um, so when you look at intention to turn over, to turn over uh, what we haven't been able to do yet is to try to do a longitudinal study and look at actual turnover uh, by tenure, and that would be fantastic. Gotcha. <laughs> Well, looking at your results um, and looking at how salesperson tenures associated income and the size of downline, um, do you find similar or different effects for the hours worked? Oh, and they're similar and extremely um, notable. I, I just put, I'll just give you a real quick insight. Um, I, I, I focused on what I thought was an interesting number of hours worked. Let's suppose you took your full-time distributors as a segment, people as, as a group, people who really are working sort of 40 hours a week, okay? And, and when we look at the effect of, of uh, saying, I stay for a career on uh, what happens to income for people in this group, the effect is very significant. Those who are not careerists um, in our group of uh, distributors uh, on average make about 16, thousand two hundred dollars per year those who say they are careers are making almost thirty four thousand dollars it's a hundred and eight percent 
difference, 108% increase from not being a careerist to being a careerist. So it's a very, very significant um, effect of saying, I do this for a career, even when I'm already apparently pretty committed as a full-timer. Um, same kind of effect on downline, 47 people versus 85, if you're not a careerist versus you are. So if you work full-time, if you work business full-time, and you say, I'm not really doing this as a, a career career, uh, you'll still have a significant downline, but even bigger uh, if you are a careerist. And, and again, you'll see the flip uh, with product discounts. So hours worked is really important. Referral is also really important with not quite the same stratospheric differences, but very statistically significant differences. Um, with referral being an important predictor of both income and downline. Let me just also add, based on what Monfred said, <clears throat> when he talked about, uh, does my supervisor help me and does the firm's input um, help me? We see the same thing in the US data we see in Europe. And, and we've seen this uh, over and over again that um, was always kind of surprising. We kept going back to check the data. How could it be that your upline you know, isn't a big correlate that the, you rate your uplines input highly. How is that not a good correlate of great outcomes? And it just isn't. The person's own activities and the nature of the firm's inputs tend to be uh, the bigger drivers, which we're kind of interested in and um, heartened to find that a durable result across the continents. Interesting. <laughs> and before I shift, I have a couple of questions for Robert as well. We have another from our audience for Anne and Monfred, however you guys would choose to divide this up. But can we determine if careerists are successful because they are careerists from the start or are they careerists in the longer term because they are successful? Which comes first? Question to Anne. I, I read this question in the chat and I thought that is a great question. This is a chicken and egg question, right? Okay. Uh, so, so our career is born or made, um, and, and here's what I'll say. I'll say, we don't know. The data speak as much as the data speak, but let me say this from other research. We know across a whole lot of behavioral research that making a positive public statement about an attitude or an intention makes you much more likely to achieve the outcome implied by that statement. This is one of the reasons that stop smoking programs, lose weight programs, et cetera, uh, rely quite heavily on people joining groups, having a buddy, making public statements, you know, going to your Weight Watchers meeting and stating publicly, my goal is to lose 20 pounds, et cetera. Similarly here, I think self-identifying, you know, in that questionnaire saying, you know what, I stay for direct selling as a career, okay? And, and we find that people who are young folks, you know, young in terms of their tenure, uh, they have higher income and high, bigger downlines than those who say they're not. Now, whether that's because they are, they self know, you know, they really know and they really are when they have a career, uh, or is there also an intentional effect? I'm, I guess there's, really both. I mean, that's a very deep, wonderful question and, and um, maybe worthy of future study, but I think the psych research would suggest that it may well be useful um, to have the person voluntarily, not you urge them to say it, but to have them voluntarily say, I'm a careerist. Yeah. I, I, I hope that's on target for the question, but yeah, that's what we know. Um, no, I think that's great. And, and Robert, just shifting to you, um, I mentioned earlier that you kind of were a driver in this, this collaboration with us and our friends at Celia uh, and looking at um, how both work with academics and universities on respective markets. How'd you sort of come to this as an important thing to, uh, to really move and, and, and sort of catalyze between the two organizations? Well, global direct selling has entered a new era of opportunity um, worldwide. And it's a, it's a, it's an era, it's an opportunity. Direct selling's never had before, and it's 120 years. And the, because the world is coming around to our values, uh, where uh, the individual gets to work on their terms when they want, uh, as much as, uh, as you want. We, we've been seeing this even pre-COVID with uh, you know, the gig and the share economies emergence over the last 10 years. 
Um, Post-COVID, we're even seeing it more, right? Especially the home-based business opportunity. Um, we're seeing some of the world's largest consumer goods companies come into our space and our channel. Uh, no matter if they call themselves direct sellers or not, they're, they're into the channel. And the, and the re and reality is the fact is direct selling, you know, direct sellers, everybody on this call, we're the foremost experts in the world on this distribution channel. Uh, again, no matter what it might be called by someone. And so we need the world to understand this reality uh, that direct selling, traditional direct selling can be the strongest example and, and a leader in this new era of uh, independent representation of products and business opportunity, of course, uh, but especially products of this social sharing, social selling, um, the you know, micro and nano influencer regarding uh, products. And the, the, the right academic research will help us convey that message to the world in the most powerful way possible. Consequently, the academic community, you know, can be our, uh, the, our strongest, most credible third party um, to help us convey this message to the world, to educate the world on, on who we are uh, and that we are doing the right things, uh, even though we can always do better and we will always do better. Um, the fact is uh, direct selling is leading the charge. Um, you know, today we've had two of the academics from um, two of the leading business schools in the world you know, doing important research on our channel and who we are. And uh, we need to do more of that. And so I saw it happening uh, over with Celdia and uh, certainly the, here in uh, the U.S. with the foundation. And uh, so bringing them together and us bringing our resources together, you know, to achieve these objectives, to address what are global issues. They're not regional issues. They're, they're global issues in direct selling. And so we need to do more of this. We need to reach out to uh, the other associations around the world, uh, as well as their at local academic relationships and and uh, combine our efforts together. Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more to have brilliant people like this who are field experts uh, in their area of study, but also know the channel well and contribute to the knowledge of the channel and knowledge about the channel and the way the channel is understood is, is huge. And it kind of leads me to my other question, Robert, of sort of how you see this value of the, the connection between um, direct selling companies and the, those around direct selling companies and uh, our academic friends? Well, you know, like we've seen today, um, the academics, professional academics doing the right research will take our data, our information and turn it into immensely powerful information um, for us to use and to get better and more successful with our businesses, but to also, you know, again, communicate uh, in their academic circles, communities, university systems, uh, and we can use to the world and to legislators. And so it's, it's vitally important that us as direct sellers um, partner with uh, the academics with our information. Everybody can see, like we've seen today, they, they use the information confidentially, um, they uh, use it professionally, and they'll use it to our best interest. And so we need more companies to get involved with Foundation, Celdia, and other at professional academic research and be contributing in that way. Uh, and frankly, also uh, with, our, with our time and money, uh, because it takes all of that as well, too. Um, and so we need the... the not just Europe and, and the US, but direct selling around the world to get this common vision around the academic research and support. Fantastic, thank you for that. And before I shift um, to Anne and Monfred with a sort of similar line of question, we have an audience question I wanna get in for you, Robert, uh, from Mary Brown at Salad Master. Uh, how do we best track turnover and inactivity trends uh, via technology as we sort of start to look at these things that Anne and Manfred are tracking and other researchers? Wow, that's uh, that's a big question. Uh, thanks, Mary, for that. Um, the an, an important question. Uh, uh, technology is at the heart of the field, right? And uh, and how they view our businesses and our industry and the opportunity. Um, the it, it's core, you know, having implementing technology in a successful way. Uh, for the field and our retail customers as well, you know, today uh, is vitally important. And so we have to continue, I would say, I mean, we didn't have it in the research today, but I, I, I would 
say for certain that you know software tools for the field are are central to how they feel about the business uh, and the and the distribution model and consequently it means direct selling companies have to continually invest uh, in years past there would be this turnover every seven or eight years or you know similar around software technology turnover uh, but in today's world it is a constant turnover we all have to be constantly innovating uh, on solutions that simplify the model, simplify the channel for the representatives and the retail consumer experience. That's just as important. You know, for direct selling uh, in the years ahead, we all have to be vitally focused on the consumer and their experience. That's why we see so many direct selling companies, you know, launching um, uh, retail customer programs, affiliate programs, uh, you know, just kind of discounts on products based on just simply sharing where consumers are not part of a, of, a, of a sophisticated compensation payout. They just love the product and love talking about it. It's natural. It's how the world works. It's how social uh, communities uh, work. So, you know, consequently, that experience that the technology for the retail customer is just as important today as it is for the for the representatives. So the, um, the turnover, I don't know if I'm answering the question, the way Mary you know, want, was asking it, but you know, the turnover uh, in technology has to be constant. Digital transformation and innovation has to be constant uh, for sure. Otherwise, if not, you will have a lot more turnover in the field and by customers uh, in terms of coming, staying or leaving the, the company. Okay. Thank you, Robert. And, and I would say to Mary and all of our guests, uh, if your questions are not answered or if you have other questions, communicate with us. Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know what you want to hear uh, more about. And I should have said at the beginning that the slides that Monfort and Ann presented will be available uh, uh, for folks that have been with us. We'll also distribute a link to a recording of this session. Um, so you'll have that available for yourself or your teams and colleagues if you want to pass that around. But I want to ask, uh, and, and, and Monfred, another question sort of related to where Robert was going. Um, this is terrific research. These are great insights. What can you tell us about what's next with regard to this research? Where do you see needs and opportunities for going even deeper with some of these important insights or what, what, would, um, what would excite you as an academic researcher uh, bring, trying to bring value to this industry of a, sort of a next level discussion? can maybe start. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, very briefly, I mean, we have been so proud and, and, and happy about this uh, nice collaboration and, and definitely the data that we had here also from two continents, very many countries, we can even do cross country comparisons, right? Uh, it's great, but they are all just snapshots in a sense, and they're self reported. So they have their shortcomings, and we can only kind of come up with inferences about kind of conclusions that are within this empirical kind of window or frame. So, and it's um, also not like strong evidence of effects over time. So the dynamics are very interesting and also factual data about, for example, actual turnover in the sense that people really terminate the contract, not just utter their intention. Um, and for that, uh, we would actually need the combination of reported, self-reported survey data and actual, I mean, hard data, so to say, from within uh, organizations. And what would help is, for example, collaborations with firms who uh, kind of then conduct these surveys and in an anonymized fashion also give, uh, combine the data uh, with like the actual uh, kind of uh, outcomes. And that would actually be a very strong uh, source for additional analyses. We would not expect big differences, but at least like this kind of, uh, let's call it objectivity of the finding, uh, we would feel much even more comfortable with, right? But Anne, I guess you have a lot of thoughts about that. Obviously, we're, we're in complete agreement on this. Um, let, me say, let me say it in the following way also. You know, what we're presenting you to, to you today out of these two surveys is largely attitudinal personal response data. And, and that is super interesting, I hope, to all of you, 
because you don't often get inside the heads of your distributors. It's not so easy to do that. What you have inside your databases at the firm are all of their names, their locations, their ethnicity, uh, how long they've been a distributor with you, what levels they've achieved, what their compensation has been, how large their downline is, when everybody joined. You have all those factual pieces of information, plus inside your firm, you know when you introduce which new products and so on. So you have that factual stuff sitting there. You don't see this attitudinal stuff so uh, or, or self-response stuff. And, uh, and so I think from that point of view, this already should be quite interesting to you. But what I will say is that it increases the power and the defensibility of results to combine the, as Monford was saying, the objective data that is not, uh, you know, this is the way I feel about something, or this is uh, what I uh, made in commissions in the last year. But you take that directly from the firm's um, database. We don't have to know who's who. Uh, that can be all protected. But you put together factual objective data with attitudinal data, and it just completely blows out the, the results in a way you can't, you can't do with just the responsive data. Um, the other thing I'll say is, and, and you know, we've kind of tried to do this a few times, it's just quite difficult, is um, to work on dynamic, naturally dynamic problems, including how does uh, a distributor build their downline over time? How, um, how does effort exerted this year result in increased downlines next year? Uh, but also how does turnover happen, right? And for that, you really do need to be able to do some, so to speak, exit interviews of departing distributors um, so that the after the fact, they already left group can be represented, not only the group that is staying. So there are a whole lot of dynamic issues, I think, uh, that come to the fore as well. We, we have tens of thousands of ideas uh, for companies that, you know, that would be willing to engage in this. And, and I would just add that both of us as empirical researchers, not, not just in our direct selling work, have done work with companies where we have taken sometimes a million observations, you know, that order of data from the firm, highly confidential. We have confidentiality contracts that we can sign that bind us and also uh, encourage us to do this work, uh, but that make sure that even after we submit an article for publication, the editor of the journal cannot come back and say, you have to tell us everything about those data. It's sealed, it's secret, you can be protected. So I hope that's, uh, that's of some um, comfort, but mm -hmm. it's just the beginning of a conversation. We'd be happy to have more of those, not just for Monfred and me, but for all of the DSEF fellows. We've got legions of us, <laughs> happy to work, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, so, and Gary, and so, you know, the important takeaway there for everyone is to reach out to you at the DSEF, to reach out to Lori Alexander at Celdia or, or their local DSA representative, but especially, you, you know, these two groups uh, around <clears throat> at participating in academic research. There's a lot of ben specific benefits to you, uh, the company, by being personally involved in the project. Yeah, well said by all. Appreciate that, Robert um, and, and Anne. And Legion is correct. There are 249 of you uh, in the U.S. Fellows Program uh, that are partners at different levels, whether it's mainstreaming understanding of the channel among the 250,000 students we've reached over the last uh, few years, or if it's this kind of, of, of really terrific research that's being done by field leaders and experts. Uh, like Anne and Monfred and Anne and Monfred and Robert, I, I thank you so much. And uh, you know, our friends at Celdia, Lori Alexander and your team, thank you uh, for this collaboration. Our USDSA uh, research and data leaders, Ben Gamzee and Monica Wood for making the data available for the US research uh, has been huge. Uh, and, and really important. I wanna encourage uh, our friends to stay with us just for another, another minute as we sign off here and say thank you to our presenters. I wanna share something that is really important uh, that we hope that you guys will uh, take a look at as well. Um, there's a new book uh, that has just been released 
called Direct Selling, a Global Social Business Model. It's a timely influential work produced by leading academics and field experts like the ones you've heard from today to mainstream understanding of the channel and its benefits to society. Uh, this book was written under the leadership of uh, our fellow and board member, uh, Vicki Crittenden at Babson, Uni Babson College. Uh, eight of our DSCF fellows were co-authors on this book, along with a very important influential industry leader that was part of that work as well. Uh, and one of those, Ann Coughlin, happens to be with us uh, right now. I don't know, Ann, if you want to say anything about the book as well. Yes. Um... I, I, of course, love this book, but it's not just because I, I wrote the chapter on compensation in this book, but I have read the whole book. And I have to tell you, this is a book uh, that is extraordinarily good. I am sharing this with my colleagues who do not understand direct selling to uh, increase their understanding of this as a, a go-to-market strategy. Um, we have people that we're sharing this with who are not academics, but who might be interested in this. And I think it's actually an ideal book to introduce maybe your younger distributors or, or your, your younger employees who come into the firm about what the heck is going on here and how do we do things. Um, I, I would just add that my compensation chapter could not have been possible without the generous input from what I call the compensation wizards at several companies that, that I've done consulting work with. I've had them sit down with me and tutor me in how their comp plans work. And, and it's just another example of how collaboration back and forth between industry and academia is, uh, is going to increase understanding and knowledge and acceptance um, in the public world, uh, but I hope also within direct selling at large. It is a great book, yep. read it. <laughs> Yeah, well said. And, and, you know, think about this book uh, for your executive staff, your field leaders, your sales force. Um, and it suggested, Anna Mumford suggested, you know, getting it to professors who are teaching classes in marketing and ethics and all of these things uh, that, are, that are covered in the book. Uh, certainly, we would distribute through our fellows programs. Um, and as a part of that work of, of mainstreaming the channel to uh, university students uh, in the U.S. and beyond, um, and another reason to buy this book that's really important and something that we should thank Anne for and her co-authors publicly is that uh, all authors uh, decided to, um, to uh, donate the uh, proceeds from the book to the work of the foundation to help us further the great things we're doing with our academic partners uh, together. So that's uh, very generous by them. It's, it's published by um, Business Expert Press. There'll be a link in the chat that is available for you. Certainly go to our website. It'll be prominent and, and easy to get to there. So um, thank you for that. And we hope you'll consider, like we said, um, using this book. Uh, imagine the credibility of people being able to pull a book with these academic leaders talking about the channel, contextualizing the channel and, and, and uh, mainstreaming understanding of it. Um, a couple of other events to mention. Um, if we can move to that slide on uh, coming events. On October 7th, uh, DSCF fellow, Dr. Stephanie Boyer will lead a webinar on best practices in diversity, equity, inclusion uh, at work and in hiring. Uh, it's open to direct selling community, uh, courtesy of Dr. Boyer. Register through the uh, Bryant University's event webpage and there'll be information from us coming as well. So we encourage you to take advantage of her expertise in that area. Uh, of course, October 13th and through 15th in Washington, DC, uh, will be the in-person uh, annual legal and regulatory seminar that DSA runs that's also being made av available um, virtually. So we encourage you to participate in that however you may. And then um, October 31st through November 3rd, very excited about DSA Engage 2021. Uh, the annual meeting uh, where we will get together in New Orleans uh, and have a terrific um, uh, lineup of content and speakers and an opportunity to get face-to-face -face as we can uh, for those that are there and that will be offered virtually as well. So um, I also encourage you to go to the DSA or DSCF website for access to other uh, Engage series webinars, uh, Engage DSA, Engage DSCF, insights that are available at the website. So please visit there uh, and, and see all the great content that's available to you and for your teams 
uh, and encourage you to uh, take advantage of that. Once again, uh, Manfred, Robert, Anne, thank you so much for this great conversation. To our audience guests, thank you for being a part of this. And um, as Anne and Manfred were saying at the end, there's a lot more value to dig into here. So we uh, expect to keep this conversation going on all fronts. Thank you all. Thanks for joining us.